turn with me, if you would, this morning together as we worship God to John chapter 15. To John chapter 15. And let's <clears throat> begin in verse 1. And I've got uh, kind of stuffed up this morning, apologize for that, but every time I fly on a plane, even well before this virus thing, uh, I usually catch something. And uh, so I've been struggling. My sinus, sinuses are kind of plugged, so it may sound nasal. Uh, forgive me for that. But uh, I'm not sucking on a, uh, a lo throat lozenge or anything because I've been informed by about three or four people that when I do that, I click it in my teeth and it's annoying. So I'll just uh, suffer through this here and hopefully not lose my voice uh, either as we go through. John chapter 15, let's begin in verse 1 and read through verse 10 to begin with. Jesus Christ says, I am the true vine. There are seven I am's in the uh, Jesus Christ talked about, and that will be a sermon message I'll be giving here uh, in the future and have in the past. But I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. The, I think the authorized version says the husbandman, but it means the same thing. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, we talked many, given many lessons, examples about this. I've done it uh, growing up and still do. You trim things back so that it will produce more. No, now, rather, you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Ephesians chapter 5 talks about the washing of the water by the word of God. If you want to be clean... You know, they say to someone who's addicted or maybe been incarcerated and is released, they want to be clean. So if you really want to be clean spiritually, it's through God's Word. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. And then he repeats in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. That's kind of important, don't you think? Because there's some that get pretty filled with themselves and think they're really the cat's meow in a religious sense. Maybe they're a, the leader of a group, a fellowship, and boy, they just puff up and strut around. Uh, we need to be careful with that. It says, he's the vine, we are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. Again, he repeats, for without me, you can do nothing. So without Jesus Christ living in us and God the Father, that relationship, you know, he's, he says he's the vine and the Father is the vine dresser. Without that relationship, what? We can do nothing. Oh, how so many have forgotten that throughout history. Verse 6, if a man abides not in me, he's cast forth as a branch and withered. And the men gather and cast them in a fire, and they are burned up. If you abide in me, and my words, the living words of God, abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done. And I might add, according to God's will. Some have asked them for ridiculous things, and, you know, I want $100 million in my bank account by tomorrow morning. I ask, and you said you'll give it to me, you'll do it. Verse 8, herein is my Father glorified. See, again, he points, Christ said, it's not me that's glorified. My Father is that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my students or my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Continue in my love. And that's where a lot of people stop. But it says, if you keep my commandments, did we read that? If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. So again, showing that, that working with, that submission to His Father, the unity of keeping His Father's commandments, so they're the same as Jesus Christ's commandments. They're not different. 
Let's go on in verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Are you joyful right now with everything going on? Are you bitter, angry, full of anxiety, nervous, trepidation, scared, worried? If you are connected to the vine and the vine dresser, our Father in heaven, is pruning you, perhaps, or me, us, it hurts when you get cut, doesn't it? When you're taken from one situation that maybe you had a really good job, you know, maybe you were in a certain fellowship, maybe you people respected you and loved you, maybe you had a family, even a physical family, you lived in a place that was you just really liked, and maybe a job transfer or just time and chance, you had to move. Your joy might be full. The book of James talks about rejoicing in our trials. That's not easy, is it? I know many of you that I know, well, my wife and I know well, looking at me now, watching and fellowshipping together, you've had a rough time of it and still are. Again, I'm not a prophet, but it ain't going to get easier before Christ returns. It's not going to go back to whatever the norm was. It's just not. And I don't think we've seen just the tip of the iceberg of what's coming. And so he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So he's building to this crescendo. He said, you have to be connected to the vine and, the, and through the Father, Jesus Christ, in this, situ in this relationship, and that you keep his commandments, that you're being washed by his word, and that the commandment is that you love one another as I have loved you. And then he goes even bigger, verse 13, greater love has no man than this. There is no greater love than you lay down your life for your friends. If you've ever been abandoned, just your back, back's turned on you when you desperately needed encouragement and support. I have. Many of you have. Jesus Christ did, was. That could be very discouraging. He said, Greater love has no man than you lay down your life for your friends. Are we willing to die for one another? We say that, you know. Yeah, I'd be willing to stand up and stand in the gap. Well, I might lose my job or my position or my respect. Or if I compromise as a politician, well, folks will understand. It's just politics. Or I can lie if I need to. You know, I was asked to lie. Am I perfect? No way. Am I sinful? Yes. Do I need to repent daily and often? Yes. Many over the years have lied to protect their backside. And they have no problem doing it. That's part of the huge problem we have in the world today. The father of lies is who? our adversary. So where does it come from? You know, the father of it. But he says, greater love is no man than this, and you lay down his life for his friends. And then he begins to explain who his friends are. He said, you, you there, me, you're my friends if you do what I command you. Whoa, time out. <laughs> you have to do what God says. Oh, but, right? You have to do what God says. And this is what I want to focus on today. Notice verse 15. From here after, from here on after, henceforth, I no longer call you servants. For the servant doesn't know what his Lord does. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father. Everything my Father that I've heard from Him. All things I have made known unto you. Notice what Christ says. I now call you friends. 
He didn't call them that before. He said, now, hereafter, right now. Did they grasp that? He said, I now call you friends. A very profound statement. One day in the 1950s, Jacques Soustel, Governor General of Algeria between 1955 and 56, returned from Algiers where he had taken an informal poll. We have so many polls anymore, don't we? It's like, who, what to believe? What they call two people and that, you know, is uh, supposed to be a representative of a million? He took an informal poll and he told the president that all of his friends were bitterly opposed to de Gaulle's Algerian policies. De Gaulle's reply, Chancelier vos amis. I don't speak French, <laughs> but he said, Chancelier vos amis, which means change your friends. De Gaulle, Charles Andre Joseph Marie, 1890 to 1970, a French statesman, statesman general. He was president 1945 to 46 and then 58 to 69. He was noted for his advocacy of me mechanized warfare, um, his opposition to an armistice with Germany, his subsequent exile and formation of the Allied Free French Forces, his policy of independent nationalism, and his withdrawal of France from NATO. That was about 1966. But he said, Chanevo Sami, change your friends. You know, Sometimes God allows us to go through things that you wonder why you went through them. It's been very, very insightful for me to understand something. I know many of you watching on here have known my wife and me for decades. Many of you didn't up until a few years ago. I now consider you our friends. And when you follow God and keep His commandments and let Him live in you, all of us do that. We become his friends. And I've learned and I'm learning that my circle of friends, they were my friends because I was part of something they were part of. But when I became not part of that, all of a sudden they drop you like a hot potato. They won't talk to you. You don't exist. Pretty sad, isn't it? Is that what God says we should do? Absolutely not. And so, not only is it vitally important who are our friends, but at times of duress, we must make sure that we focus on the greatest friends we have. And you know who those are? You're ahead of me. Christ and God the Father. And not be led in a direction that does not bear good fruit simply because someone is our friend. Have you ever had somebody say, hey, let's go do this? And you're like, eh, I don't want to get involved with that. And they're like, come on, man, you're my friend. And, you know, friends stick together like flies at a cake at a picnic, <laughs> you know. Sometimes you have to say, look, I love you, and you're still my friend, but I can't do this or this, or I won't be part of this. That's hard, isn't it? You know, there's a danger of having the wrong friends, because your friends will influence you. You might have had a friend for many years, maybe even from growing up, that can influence you, good or bad. We must, as we heard in the first message, remember to stay connected with God and never put friends ahead of God. I want to repeat that. Don't ever put friends or if you're MCI from years ago, and family, physical family, maybe you call your spiritual family where you fellowship, do not put anyone ahead of God. There's this scripture that says, if you're not willing to forsake mother, father, sister, brother, yea, and your own life also, you cannot be my disciple. Good friends 
likewise, will also influence you. In Philippians chapter 4 at verse 8, Philippians chapter 4, yeah, verse 8, Finally, brethren, and this would be a good scripture to memorize, whatsoever things are true, are honest, are just, are pure, are lovely, are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think, meditate, muse, ponder, muse, dwell on these things. It's part of the reason I am about that close of getting off Facebook. Because there are many things on there every day. And I get all kinds of messages and texts and things from people meeting well. I'm like, is it true? Is it honest? Is it just? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it of good report? It is, does it have virtue or praise? Someone recently told me, my friend has betrayed me. And we're all so sensitive. Many of us have been burnt over the years and turned, turned on and thrown under the bus, as we say, some of us. We feel like we've been betrayed. Where can we find a friend who won't betray us? There's a word, some words of a song, and you always take a chance when you do this because there's those that will view this later or maybe connect it even now that they lean one direction, others lean another direction, and somewhere in between of those two directions is the middle. But there's words of a song, what a friend we have in Jesus. 20 years ago, if I were to say that, oh my, people would say, there he goes, turn him off. But the, the lyrics go like this, what a friend we have in Jesus, or Jesus Christ, all our sins and griefs to bear, what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. And when we pray to God the Father, and is it wrong to pray to Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. But do we do that? He says we're his friend, and he and God the Father are one, so by extension, would you not say that God the Father is our friend? Let's go to Proverbs 18, verse 24. I've uh, looked at this scripture many times, thought about it. Proverbs 18, verse 24, a man that has friends must show himself friendly. You know, when you've been burnt by someone or thrown under the bus or, or just betrayed, it's hard to make friends with anybody. You're very cautious. You're very skeptical. Do I reach out and make myself vulnerable? You know, I tend to like to tease people that I love. And that can backfire sometimes because people can get offended, you know. Some people don't like to be teased, don't like to be joked about. And I recognize that and work on that. However, I don't want to be where I'm not going to be friendly or, or relax with anyone. Now, what, I once had a minister in my own house tell me, you need to realize you're up here and all these other people are down here. As a minister, the ministry's up here, and the brethren, they're down here, which stinks to high heaven, by the way, and you need to repent of that. No. Jesus Christ said, you're my friends. With your friends, do you say, well, I'm up here, and you're all down here? No. We're all part of the body of Christ. God doesn't separate, does He? And so, we... There's a man, he has to show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. What does that mean? 
you have a physical brother or sister, generally they're going to stick really close to you. And, you know, when you're in a tight spot, they may not even get along with you well, but your family, right? Well, it says there is a friend that's even closer than that. They're willing to lay their life down for you. Right? You know, when people die, we are at loss for words. And sometimes we'll say, if you need anything, call. You ever had somebody call and said, I need something. I need a place to stay for six months. Or I need this, or I need that. And we need to remember something, friends. Romans chapter 8, let's go to verse 31. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. Again, I apologize for that little glitch there. Hopefully we can clean that up at the recording. And let's go back in verse 28. It says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn of many brethren. Moreover, when he did predestinate, he also called. And whom he called, he also justified. And justified, he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? All these challenges of things we go through against the flesh, against the, the problems, the challenges, as we heard in the first message, the, the trials, that, that word we use in the church or the fellowships, the body of Christ. If God be for us, who can be against us? God's grace, that divine favor, that love that He has for us is God's love expressed. When we have friends we care for, would we not do anything for them? You know, my, my father-in-law was over uh, recently a few weeks ago to help and he put in a, a door in my office uh, that needed one. And he, I said, you know, I want to pay you for this. He said, we're family. Well, we're family. We're friends. And, you know, I think of the baptism ceremony. I've baptized some of you that are connected. I know that. It says, and you may remember this, maybe not. It may have been a long time ago. In that Jesus Christ is our high priest in heaven, and he makes intercession for us to God the Father, that, that high priest that goes between, that connects us, that makes it possible, it intercedes for us. In the baptism ceremony, I will say, uh, and we'll use the name George, I'll say, looking at the person, I'll say, since you, George, have repented of your sins, which are contrary to to and against God's holy, righteous, and perfect law, and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, your Lord and Master, your High Priest, and soon coming King, I now baptize you, not into any sect or denomination of this world, that I used to say not into the Worldwide Church of God or the United Church of God or whatever church you're part of, I don't say into the Church of God ministries. I don't say that. I say they're not in any sect or denomination in this world, but the name of the Father and the Son and through the Holy Spirit. I do this by and through the name and the authority of Jesus Christ for the remission of all your sins. Amen. No one can separate us but ourselves. Because Christ said what? I now call you friends. He's our ultimate friends. Some have taken acceptance over the years, an exception, rather, that we sometimes address Jesus Christ in our prayers. I, in my prayers, have always said, Father in heaven, as we come before you and at your right hand, Jesus the Christ, your Son, I have no problem doing that. I don't. In Acts chapter 7, let's see why I could, let's substantiate this. Acts chapter 7 and verse 54. Notice what is recorded for our edification. 
here we see the story of Stephen when he's stoned. And before, right before dying, verse 55, he being full of the Holy... Let's go to 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth, verbally. They didn't bite him, but just tore into him verbally. He, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly, right, very focused into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So there he stood with God the Father. And when we pray to God, do you think Jesus Christ also hears our prayers? He's right there alongside his Father. Have you ever been right next to somebody and somebody comes up? Maybe I do this with my wife a lot. We're standing together and someone comes up and they're talking to her or me. I can, even though I have hearing uh, challenges, I still can hear most of what's being said. Yet some have said, oh, you can't ever pray and do that. It's got to be to God the Father and forget Jesus Christ. No, the two of them are together as one. You know, there are many that get caught up in semantics and say, well, in this situation or that situation, it was only God the Father and Jesus Christ was never there. It was only Jesus Christ. Do you want to spend hours debating some of these issues? Right? The creation, were they both there? Probably. Nope, couldn't be. And that causes splits and division when you start taking, separating where there's one God, one Lord, one Father in you all, and one Spirit. Where one Jesus Christ, we're all together, that's all in one Spirit, and you start separating it all out. Yeah, we pray to God the Father, but Jesus Christ at His right hand, as we just read here. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 20, you see, he said to his disciples, by extension to us, I now call you friends. I'm not sure I grasp that completely. Maybe you do. I don't have very many good friends anymore that I can call and talk to, and they don't say, oh, you're bad because you're not part of our group, or... Well, you're, I love this word, you're independent. Independent of what? The body? No. Independent of God the Father and Jesus Christ? No. Independent of your specific fellowship? Not necessarily. Only because you say that. Do you see, this has always been a challenge that I'm not sure. That's, man, that's a man thing. And we proof text it to say, you can't talk to these people or that people. You can't. Christ said to love your neighbor as yourself. Did you know that neighbor means they have to be part of your fellowship? If they're of a maybe Catholic or Presbyterian or evangelical, oh, you can't talk with them because they, they're bad. Well, God hasn't opened their mind yet. But does he say you walk along in your self-righteous glory and it's all about you and the 1,000 or 5,000 or 12,000 people you have? Shame on us. No, it doesn't say that. He said, I have called you friends, and if you're connected to the vine, and the Father's the vine dresser, then he says, I call you my friends because you keep my commandments and you do my will. And, and you can remember this, okay? When everything starts really getting ugly out here, worse and worse and worse, and people are clawing and scratching to survive for food, and so we get really into that mode. We're missing what Jesus Christ said. You are my friends. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 20, which is where I was going, um, notice, there are times when we pray to God and address Jesus Christ directly, as John does here. He which testify these things, surely I come quickly, amen, even so come, Lord Jesus. So he's talking to Jesus Christ. 
Christ is the firstborn of many sons, therefore he's our brother too. In Proverbs 17, 17, what does that say? Let's go there. Let's go back there. Proverbs 17, verse 17. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. So a true friend is going to love you. You hurt him or her. You do something. You ask for forgiveness. What are they going to say? I love you, man. It's okay. That love didn't change. What do we do? What have we done over the years? Somebody does something we don't like and we cut them off. We won't talk to them. We won't fellowship with them. They disappeared. Right? I'm not complaining about me. I'm just saying in general. Do we exemplify the Spirit of God and how we are, Christ said, you are my friends. He doesn't say you if you're here or here. We forget that he says he died for everybody, sinners, of which Paul said, I am the chief sinner. So did he die for all of us or just those that aren't like us that keep the commandments of God and don't eat pork? I think we need to go back and reexamine when he says, I call you my friends. John 15, 13 says what? Laying down our lives. Sometimes that means doing that Literally. Have you ever had to lay your life down for somebody? Literally, risk everything you have. Not too many, but some have. In my late teens, there was a famous song that many will recall. I would love to play it, the recording. I played it again, listened to it. I have it on my computer. But due to copyright laws, I'd be sued. And so I'm going to try to sing parts of it, but I'll at least state it. It was by Andrew Gold. Um, it was recorded in his third album, which was, I think the album was All This in Heaven too. The single version reached uh, number 25 of the Billboard. Uh, Top, top 100 chart, about 1978, by Andrew Gold. Thank you for being a friend. I just got a text here. It's kind of funny. It says, as we're watching the live stream this morning, we notice that every time you raise your hands, the live stream was interrupted. Coincidence or God's humor? <laughs> <laughs> but it, I wish I could play the music. It would make it better. You'd recognize it. But it's, it goes, thank you for being a friend. Traveled down a road and back again. Your heart is true. You're a pal and a confidant. I'm not ashamed to say. I hope it always will stay this way. My hat is off. Won't you stand up and take a bow? And then the drum plays. He says, and if you threw a party, invited everyone you knew, you would see the biggest gift would be for me, and the card attached would say, thank you for being a friend. Thank you for being a friend, it repeats that. If it's a car you lack, I'd surely buy you a Cadillac. Whatever you need any time of the day or night, I'm not ashamed to say, I hope it always will stay this way. My hat is off. Why don't you stand up and take a bow? And this one I can relate to. He says, and when we both get older, with walking canes and hair of gray, have no fear, even though it's hard to hear, I will stand real close and say, thank you for being a friend. I want to thank you. Thank you for being a friend. I want to thank you. Thank you for being a friend. Let me tell you about, and when we die and float away into the night, the Milky Way, 
you hear me call as we ascend, I'd say your name then once again. Thank you for being a friend. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7, let's go back there. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, in verse 7. Are you not thou our God, who did drive out the inhabitants of this land for for your people Israel, and gave it to the seed of Abraham, your friend, forever? How would you like to be God's friend forever? We are and we can be. In Isaiah 41, verse 8, he said, Abraham, you are my friend. Abraham was called a friend of God. You know, Abraham, if you remember, laughed. Even Sarah laughed before God. She wasn't being disrespectful. They had such a good relationship. She said, seriously, you think I'm going to get pregnant and he's going to be able to, to make that happen? That's funny. And they laughed. Do you think God said, I don't find this humorous? Well, if you were the age that they were, that's funny. And they had a good enough relationship, they could laugh together. You know, one of the things that I found over the years in the church of God, especially in the ministry, you don't laugh enough. It's not funny. Everything's serious all the time. And it can be. I have a good friend that's moving from Ohio, being transferred here shortly to South Dakota that we, over the years, have laughed and laughed and laughed. And his family and ours. Uh, and people would say, how can you think everything's funny? We didn't think everything's funny, no. But sometimes things are. I gave a message years ago, the humor of God, and people were like, you know, you read the Bible, and God said, it's all serious and monotone. There's things that are really funny. Christ was funny. He was Jewish. Most of your comedians are Jewish. You know that? And so, friends should be able to laugh. Moses had a close friendship between Moses and God. During the Civil War of 1863, this January in fact, Abraham Lincoln was meeting with his cabinet during a very stressful time. He was telling a joke from a comedian of the time, Artemis Ward. The Secretary of War Stanton scolded Mr. Lincoln for telling a joke as if he was with friends. Mr. Lincoln replied, If I do not laugh as if with friends, I will lose my mind. He then pulled something out of a hat and said, Gentlemen, I now present the Emancipation Proclamation. Sometimes we say, well, we have to be serious all the time. Those aren't the kind of friends that you're going to enjoy. Do you know Christ never laughed? Ever? Right? Wrong. We know he did. Right? He laughed with Abraham, right, his friend. He said to his disciples, be of joy, dudes. It's tough, but guess what? I've overcome the world, you know? No, he just walked around and said, when I speak to you, you may utter. No, right? I think we need to stop and ask ourselves a question. Let's go to Exodus chapter 33. He said, I now call you friends. I'd like you to meditate on that. Think about that. Exodus chapter 33, verse 1. And the Lord 
spoke and said unto Moses, Depart and go there, you and the people which you brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, Unto your seed I will give it. And I will send an angel before you. And I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite, and the Vegemite. No, Vegemite wasn't in there. Unto a land flowing with milk and honey. I remember one time in teaching a class, uh, I asked these young people, what was a land like flowing with milk and honey? And this one kid piped up and said, pretty sticky and smelly after it got in the hot sun. That's not what he meant. He meant flowing with the good things. For I will not go up in the middle of you, for you are a stiff-necked people, lest I consume you in the way. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned and did no man did put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said unto Moses, saying the children of Israel, You're a bunch of stiff-necked people. I will come up in the midst of a moment, consume you. Therefore now put off my ornaments from you, and I may know what to do unto you. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. And Moses took the tabernacle, he pitched it without the camp, far off from the camp, called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went in the tabernacle, which was without the camp. And it came to pass when Moses went out in the tabernacle, all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone in the tabernacle. Like my daughter, granddaughter will look at me and go. So they all stood at the door and just went, right? As it came to pass, as Moses entered the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. And the Lord spoke unto Moses face to face as a man speaks unto his friend. And he turned again to camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. So here Joshua is mentioned again. He spoke to him face to face as a friend. Here's how you talk to a friend, okay? All of you are my friends. Here's how I'm going to talk to you. So anyway, you know, I think we should maybe do this or do that. Wouldn't that just be great? Right? I had a friend growing up that used to like to talk right in your personal space. He'd get right here in your face. and He'd put his arm around you and he'd say, Scotty, it'd be right there. I used this version or this verse in an article I wrote for Vertical Thought and uh, a publication called The Good News on Godly Communication. Uh, it was entitled, Is God Intended Communication Disappearing? November 3rd, 2011. It's still on the web. Hasn't been... Uh, taken off like so many other things. But godly communication. Are we a friend with God? He said, I call you my friends. Can you get on the phone if, to a friend and talk to him? I have some friends I don't talk to all the time, maybe once, a couple times a year. And we call, we'll talk for an hour and a half just like no time has gone by. When we talk to God, is it as a friend? Proverbs chapter 27, verse 5. Let's go there. Would you go with me, please? Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 5. We'll look at some verses. This one is always difficult. It says, open rebuke is better than secret love. God does that with us sometimes. In chapter 27, in verse 6, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You remember who kissed Christ? Judas. Came up and kissed him on the cheek, or whatever the culture was. You know, the Colombians where we used to serve did that. They'd come up and on both sides, sometimes the women just on the forehead or who knows where. It's what they were. It's a friend. It's a greeting. He said, faithful are the wounds of a friend. The ones who love you, they're willing to say, I, 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 I just need to mention this. We need to talk about it. You know, some of us, you, you mention anything and you're on edge right away and defensive. Not healthy. It shows something not working right. Right? 
The full soul loathes an honeycomb, but to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. As a bird that wanders from her nest, so is a man that wanders from his place. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart, so does the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. You know, if you want a true friend to tell you what he thinks, I had a man once I used to work for, they would say, I don't want to hear any bad news ever. It's got to be all good news. I don't want the church hearing any bad news. It's got to be good news. I'm like, that's not real. That's not helpful. If you only want people, friends, that are going to say, here, here, I agree with you, it's not a good place to be. Thine own friend and your father's friend forsake not, neither go into your brother's house in the day of the calamity, for better is a neighbor that is near than a brother afar off. My son, be wise and make my heart glad that I may answer him that reproaches me. A prudent man foresees the evil, hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Take his garment that is surety for a stranger and take a pledge for him for a strange woman. This one here, I had a man that used to work for me, <laughs> loved him dearly, but he that blesses his friend with a loud voice rising early in the morning shall be counted a curse to him. I've never really been a morning person. At 4 o'clock in the morning, somebody come down your driveway, hey, how you doing? You know, you're like, whoa, 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 wait till I've had my coffee and wake up. A continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Whosoever hides her hides the wind and the ointment of his right hand which betrays himself. Iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. You know, when you sharpen iron, the angle of inclination is really important. If you get it too blunt directly on, it can ruin the blade and it hurts. It's pretty, pretty, causes problems, doesn't it? You know, Sometimes in this life, Christ corrects his children and his church, the body. And do we say, well, I'm not going to be your friend anymore? Of course we don't. Of course we don't. Let's hear as we get near the closing today. Let's go to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. I want to read a lot of verses here, but I think it's definitely something we need to consider. John chapter 20, 21. John chapter 21 and verse 1. And these things Jesus showed himself again, the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on his wise showed himself there were Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel, remember the guy under the fig tree, of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, remember them, James and John, the sons of thunder, and the other two other disciples. Simon Peter said unto them, I'm just going to go fishing. They say unto him, We also, we're going with you. We've had enough. Let's just go fishing. They went forth and entered into a ship, and that night they caused not, caught nothing. And when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. For some reason, he appeared a little bit different to them. Maybe it's because they were up working all night and they were tired and their eyes were fuzzy. I don't know. Then Jesus said unto them, You babes in Christ, <laughs> in reality, children, have you any meat? And they said, No. Do you have any food? No. And he said unto them, Cast your net on the right side, and you'll find. And they did, and now they were able not draw it up, for there's so much fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, which we know was John, said unto Peter, It is the Lord. And now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and cast himself into the sea. Kind of shows Simon Peter's personality. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land, but as it were 200 cubits, this type of net dragging the net with fishes. As soon as then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals, and the fish was laid on it and bread. I had a, one time a trip to Guatemala. We were on a lake, and the doctor that was, we were with, staying with before I had some surgery done, they caught some fish, they had somebody who caught some fish, and they made a tortillas and cooked on that 
open fire there, and we ate that. Man, that was good. And Jesus said unto them, Bring of the fish which you have caught. And Simon Peter went up, and he drew the net to the land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three. So there's a reason for why it mentions that, and that's another message. And for all there were so many, it was not the net broken. And Jesus said unto him, Come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples asked him, Who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? They were pretty savvy. They picked up on it pretty quick. Jesus then came and taketh bread and give them the fish. Now this was the third time Jesus had showed himself his disciples after he was risen from the dead. And when they dined, they had breakfast. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, Agape, do you love me? Son of John, rather, do you love me? More than these fish. And he said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Philia, different word. He said unto him, feed my lambs. Do you love me? Feed my lambs. He said unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said, then feed my sheep. And he said unto him a third time, Simon, son of John, again, this brotherly filia, do you love me? Peter was grieved. He was emotionally moved <coughs> because he said unto him a third time, do you love me? And he said unto him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Then Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Truly I say unto you, when you were young, you girded yourself and you walked. You know, you did your own thing. But when you shall be old, you shall stretch forth your hands. Another will dress you and carry you where you need to go. This he spoke, signifying what death he would glorify God. Tradition says Peter was crucified upside down. And when he had spoken, he said to him, follow me. And Peter turned about, seeing John, whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper. And he said, Lord, which is he that betrays you? And Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? And Jesus said to him, if you will that he lives till I come, what is that to you? Follow you me. Jesus Christ said, remember earlier, I call you my friends. And he said, if you're my friend, follow me. Follow me. Do what I've said. Keep my commandments. Love me. Love your brother. Be willing to lay your life down for your brother and sisters, those that are there. Others. Let's go back and let's read John chapter 15 and let's close with that today. John chapter 15 and verse 15. He said, Henceforth I do not call you servants, for the servant doesn't know what his Lord does, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known to you. I have shared that with you. What a blessing it is to have our Savior, our High Priest, our Elder Brother call us His friend. Let's not take this lightly. Let's not forget this, for truly He anticipates a future ahead that is glorious, it is bright, that He wishes to share with His family and His friends for eternity. Godspeed that day. If you join me, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. We come before you and at your right hand, our friend, our brother, Jesus the Christ, your son, which was the word that before the foundation of the world, knew what you planned, you knew what was going to happen. You had a plan that if those things went south, that Jesus Christ, your Son, the Word would become flesh, dwell among us, and die. That blood would be spilled for all of us. But yet, He would be resurrected, as we will be too. We look forward to that. Help us, Father. Strengthen us. Help us to learn 
more deeply to appreciate what it is to have Jesus Christ as our friend and you, God, as our Father. What that means. And one another. And Father, just as the veil was rent in two, can we not strip down the stupidity that separates us from the love of Christ and others because we say, well, they can't be my friend because, and fill in the blank. Times are going to get difficult, Father. What will it take to wake your people up? Your kingdom come, your will be done. God, we thank you, we love you, we just pray your dismissal. Bless the meals that we'll be eating. Go with us, encourage us, and Father, help us to band together as your children and to band together as a friend of Jesus the Christ. We thank you in his name, our Savior, our Lord and Master, and our friend. Amen.